Shalom and welcome everyone. I want to welcome you once again and joining me in Checkpoint Training Bites. Checkpoint Training Bites is where we bring you advanced training on Checkpoint products, features, and plates. In this training module, we'll be looking at the Checkpoint Firewall. And here, we will continue our discussion regarding a stateful inspection firewall. But before we begin our discussion, let's take a few moments to take a look at the agenda of this module. First, we will start off our discussion in this module by talking about how a stateful inspection firewall keeps the virtual circuit session safe. We will discuss the start and end timeouts of a virtual session and also discuss the data transfer session timeouts. Then we will continue our discussion with the focus being on UDP protocol. How a stateful inspection firewall helps protect a stateless protocol like UDP against mischievous and nefarious sources. The next we will continue our discussion with the ICMP protocol, how a stateful inspection firewall protects the integrity of an ICMP session. And finally, we'll end this module by talking about the connection table. And here, we will discuss why you need to check the connection table size and when it is appropriate to increase the connection table limit. And so I want to start off our discussion from where we left off in the previous video. In the previous video, we talked about TCP. And we mentioned that TCP is a connection-oriented protocol and that it needs to establish a virtual circuit in order to transfer any data. And now a stateful inspection firewall needs to prevent against any attacks that might try to compromise the virtual circuit. A stateful inspection firewall needs to prevent against certain attacks during the handshake or attacks that might try to steal the data during the data transfer phase or to protect from attacks that might try to jeopardize the teardown. And so a stateful inspection firewall has a few preventive countermeasures that protects the connection or session against many kinds of attacks that try to compromise any part of the virtual circuit. And so next, I'd like to focus on three main values that a stateful inspection firewall uses that helps mitigate from attacks against a virtual circuit. And these three values are, first, there is a TCP start timeout, then there is a TCP session timeout, and finally, we'll talk about the TCP end timeout. And all of these timeouts correspond to the virtual circuit phases that we talked about before. This TCP start timeout corresponds to the handshake phase. The TCP session timeout refers to the data transfer phase. And the TCP end timeout corresponds to the teardown phase. And so let's go through each of these three timeout values to see how they help mitigate against attacks. And so one preventive check is that the handshake has to happen during a specific time of 25 seconds. This is known as the TCP start timeout. The TCP start timeout by default is set to 25 seconds, but you can increase or decrease this timeout value as needed and if needed. And so the three-way handshake has to happen within the 25 seconds or else the connection is removed from the kernel. And if a reply packet comes in after the 25 seconds default timeout has expired, and that the connection has been deleted from the connection table, then the packet will be dropped as out of state. And so the client will need to renegotiate a new handshake if he wants to reestablish a new connection. Having this TCP start timeout will help prevent against SYN flood attacks. A SYN flood attack is where an attacker might try to send a SYN packet, and then the attacker will not send the final ACK packets, the final acknowledgement, to complete the three-way handshake. And so an incomplete handshake will use up memory resources, and multiple of these attacks can quickly fill up the connection state tables. And so at minimum, this attack will exhaust processing resources, which can prevent legitimate connections from getting established, or worst case scenario, cause memory failures that will cause the box to crash, hang, or reboot. And so if the final ACK in a three-way handshake is not received within those 25 seconds, and then this connection is deleted from the connection table, this will help prevent the connection table from getting full, which is what the SYN flood attack is trying to do. The SYN flood attack will try to compromise and exhaust memory or processing resources. And so let me give you an example in order to help clarify this TCP start timeout. I have seen cases where a customer has a slow remote connection or the packet is passing through a slow bandwidth pipe. And so the handshake will take longer than 25 seconds. So increasing the TCP start timeout will help give more breathing room for those connections to get established. But today, with most customers and ISPs using high-speed bandwidth, it is very rare to make a change here. But just a note, if you do need to make a change, 
then this change is a global change, meaning it will affect every TCP connection, every TCP handshake. And so you cannot make an individual change for a specific application or service. And so this change will affect every application, every service. And so every service, every application will now have a new TCP start timeout, which is set to the new value, to the new timeout setting that you have configured. And so next, once the handshake has been established, then the connection goes into the data transfer stage. This stage is called the TCP session timeout, which has a default of 3,600 seconds, which is one hour timeout. The data transfer phase will be open for a complete hour. As long as files and data are exchanged between the two hosts, this one hour is always refreshed. But once the data exchange is completed, and then after one hour of an idle connection, this connection is flushed from the connection table. One hour is the default timeout, and I have seen some customers increase the timeout to two hours or a maximum of 24 hours, depending on the application or service in question. This setting can be a global setting, which means that it applies to all services. All services will now have a new default timeout. Note that this global change will be applied to all services and all firewalls that are managed by this management station. Or maybe I don't want to change it for all services. Maybe I just want this to be granular and apply it for only one or two specific services. So I can have my global setting, timeout setting, set to default of one hour and configure only a specific service to timeout in two hours, three hours, or 24 hours by changing only a specific service. Or reverse, I can have all my services timeout in two or 24 hours by changing the global setting for all services and have only one specific service to time out in an hour. But this last option is not suggested. I use it here to illustrate for teaching purposes only. It's recommended to keep the global setting of the default of an hour, but only if you run into issues with a specific service and with the assistance of Checkpoint Senior or Escalation Support, they might give you the suggestion to increase or decrease the timeout value for a specific service. Another example, I have seen the customers with an in-house application. And this application and service written by the customer does not follow the standard TCP RFC standards, or at least the standards that Checkpoint follows. And then the connections gets terminated every hour, even though the client and server are still passing traffic. And in troubleshooting this, I increase the TCP session timeout to two hours, and now the connections get terminated every two hours. And if I increase the TCP session again up to three hours, then the problem follows. Problem happens every three hours. And so this tells me that I'm dealing with an in-house application, or at least an application that does not follow the standard TCP RFC practices. Now let's talk about the termination timeout. This is known as the TCP end timeout, and this value by default is set to 20 seconds. A terminated connection can happen for two reasons. One reason is during a connection teardown. When the firewall receives the first fan packet on a connection, it sets the connection to half closed. Once the firewall receives the second fan, then it sets the connection to closed. During a teardown, the firewall needs to see two fin packets, one packet in each direction from client to server, and then from the server to client. A second reason that a terminated connection can occur is during a connection reset. Either the server or the client sends a reset packet, which will close the connection. When either one of these two things occurs, the connection in the connection table is marked as closed. But the firewall does not delete it yet. It gives 20 seconds grace period in case there are any trailing packets being sent between the client and the server. So any late packets will still be allowed between the client and the server within those 20 seconds. And this value is refreshed as needed as long as packets are being exchanged. But after 20 seconds of an idle connection, then the connection is completely removed from the connection table. So any other packets that arrive later after those 20 seconds will be dropped as out of state. And so up until now, I've been talking about TCP, which is a stateful protocol. But I mentioned in the previous video that UDP is not a stateful protocol. And so how does a stateful inspection firewall keep track of UDP connections? Well, it uses a virtual session timeout, which by default is set to 40 seconds. This means that the request packet first needs to be processed by the rule base, and then an entry is added to the kernel table with a 40 seconds timeout. If the reply 
returns within those 40 seconds, then reply is accepted. On the other hand, if the reply only returns after those 40 seconds has expired, then a reply is dropped as out of state, since the original request has already been removed from the connection table. And so let me give you a few examples to help clarify this. First, we'll use DNS as our UDP protocol. And so this client needs to do a DNS lookup. And so the client sends a DNS request to a DNS server. And the request packet arrives at the firewall, and this connection is processed and accepted by the firewall's rule base. And so it updates this request in the connection table with a 40 second default timeout. And then the packet is forward and processed on its way to the DNS server. If the DNS server replies within those 40 seconds, then the packet is accepted. But if the packet arrives outside those 40 seconds, then the packet is dropped as out of state. And so the client will need to resend another DNS request, or maybe this time it will send it to a different or to another DNS server. And so these 40 seconds virtual session timeout should be enough time to allow a reply to return in 40 seconds. I have never had to increase this timeout value. That's not to say that it has not happened, just that I never encountered an issue where I needed to increase it. One question that is often asked is what happens if the data download takes longer than 40 seconds? And so in this next example, let's use TFTP, which is also a UDP protocol. And so it can take longer than 40 seconds to download files from a TFTP server. And so as long as files are being processed through the firewall for that virtual session, then the timeout is refreshed. Only after there is no more data being exchanged between the hosts and the connection has been idle for longer than 40 seconds, and so then the virtual session will be deleted from the connection table. Then any late trailing packets that return after the 40 seconds virtual session timeout has expired, then those packets will also be dropped as out of state. And so now let's talk about the ICMP protocol, the Internet Control Messaging Protocol, which is neither a TCP or a UDP protocol. ICMP is its own protocol. It's a layer three protocol. It is the IP protocol layer helper. It helps IP determine and diagnose a network related issues. ICMP does not use port numbers. Only layer four protocols like TCP and UDP use port numbers. Since ICMP is a layer three protocol, how does a stateful inspection firewall keep track of a stateless and portless protocol like ICMP? Well, very similar to UDP, a stateful inspection firewall uses an ICMP virtual session timeout. This is a complete and separate virtual session timeout just for ICMP packets. The ICMP virtual session timeout by default is set to 30 seconds. So each ICMP request and reply has to occur within those 30 seconds. An ICMP request that is accepted by the firewall's rule base will be tracked in the kernel with the kernel state entry with a 30 second timeout. An ICMP request and reply has to take place within those 30 seconds, or else the ICMP replies will be dropped as out of state. But since ICMP does not use port numbers, the kernel tables need to keep track of the replies and match them to the corresponding ICMP requests. So instead of using port numbers, the kernel tables keep track of the ICMP requests packet ID numbers. Each TCP packet has an ID number in the IP header field. And so an ICMP reply packets ID number has to match one of the requests packets ID numbers. And so if the reply packet matches a request ID number in the kernel tables, then the packet is accepted and processed out on its way. And so each ICMP reply not only has to match an ICMP request within those 30 seconds, but it also has to match the corresponding packets ID numbers within the connection table or else the packet will be dropped as out of state. So far, we've been talking about the connection table. And so on this same topic, I would like to discuss that this table, you can set the limit of how many connections can be processed by the firewall. The connection table limit by default is set to 25,000 connections. When the connection table reaches the default limit of 25,000 connections, then no new connections will be allowed. That is why it's so important to prevent SYN slot attacks, to help prevent this connection table limit from getting exhausted. But the good news is that this limit is not static. You can increase the connection table limit if it gets full with legitimate traffic. And so if the connection table is getting full, I usually will double the connection table limit. So I will double it from 25,000 to 50,000 connections. And if it gets full again, I will double it from 50,000 to 100,000, from 100,000 to 200,000. That's of course, if you start off with 25,000 connections. I know that some firewalls are sold to support thousands, if not millions of connections. And so in those instances, 
If you know you need more than 200,000 connections, let's say you need 200,000 connections, then I will usually start with increasing the connection table capacity to a little bit higher, let's say 250,000 connections. And when the table gets full, I will double it, which will double the connection table capacity. Now let me give you a scenario where the connection table was getting full to help clarify and illustrate this. A customer called in and he was complaining that he was having intermittent issues with new connections not getting established. Sometimes new connections worked and sometimes new connections were failing. But existing connections were fine. Existing connections were okay. And so in this scenario, this is one of the first things that I looked at. I checked the connection table to see what the peak value was set at. And if it had peaked at close to the limit, and in this case the connection table had peaked at 25,000 which means that the connection table was at full capacity. And so I doubled the capacity of the connection table, which solved the issue, and now new connections were getting established. And so that's usually one of the first things that I look at. If a customer has an issue with intermittent connections not getting established, I'll usually first check the connection table to see what the peak is currently at. And if it's close to the set limit, then I will double it. But that was the best case scenario. You have to be very careful when you increase the connection table limit. You have to keep an eye on it. So now I will give you a worst case scenario to help illustrate this. Here, I have another customer that called in with the same problem. New connections could not be established, but existing connections were fine. And so I checked the connection table and it peaked at the connection table limit. So I increased the connection table from 25,000 to 50,000. And soon, new connections were also having intermittent issues. And so I checked the connection table again, and now it had reached a new peak of 50,000 connections. And so again, I increased the connection table. This time, I increased it from 50,000 to 100,000. But within minutes, the connection table was peaking again close to 100,000 connections. So I knew something different was happening here. But what was it? I was not sure. Then after discussing this problem with the customer, we came to realize that there was no way that the connection table should be getting this full. The customer did not have that many users, did not have that many PCs to use up that many connections. And so we did some more digging around, some more diagnostics of the appliance, and we noticed that the system was also running out of memory. There was a bunch of error messages in the syslogs. I was seeing a bunch of memory errors that memory buffers were getting full. And then during further analysis of the connection table, we noticed that there was a few hosts that were eating most of the connection capacity from the connection table. And so maybe you've guessed that already. And so it turned out that some hosts were infected with a worm. And the worm was trying to propagate itself. And so it was quickly filling up the connection table with all new connections, which was preventing legitimate connections from getting fulfilled. And so I used this last example to help illustrate two points. One, that you can increase the connection table if needed, as long as your hardware supports it. I mean that it has enough memory and processing power. And two, if the connection table is full, to be aware of worms or viruses on your network. And so if the connection table is getting full, you need to ask yourself a question. Should I have this many connections? And if you should, then go ahead and increase the connection table. If you should not, then check the syslogs for memory buffer errors. Check if you have high or unusual traffic patterns. And so now in every case, when I notice that the connection table is getting full, I will usually make the assumption that it might be a virus or worm on the network. And so you have to always look at both symptoms with regards to a virus or worm on the network. And so first I will check the connection table is getting full. And also I will check if the system is running out of memory. And specifically, if I have memory allocation errors. If so, then it might be a worm. If not, then I will increase and double the connection table capacity. And so before we end this session, let's take a few moments to review the topics discussed in this module. We first started off this module by talking about TCP and how Stateful Inspection Firewall needs to protect the integrity of the virtual circuit. We discussed how Stateful Inspection Firewall uses the TCP start timeout to make sure that the handshake occurs during the 25 second default start timeout window. And then we discussed how the handshake will be dropped as out of state if the packet arrives outside the expired 25 second timeout window. And then we discussed some reasons why customers might want to increase this window. Like if the remote users are behind a slow bandwidth pipe. And we also discussed that this TCP start timeout is a global setting that will affect every TCP handshake. And then we discussed that the session timeout, which by default is set to an hour. And this timeout determines the data transfer phase.
and that the connection will be established for a complete hour and any packets from that connection that arrive later after the one hour idle window has expired, then again those packets will be dropped as out of state. And then we mentioned the session timeout, which can be a global setting or a specific setting. And so there's a global setting that if increased, will increase every TCP session timeout. But if you want to be more granular, you can increase the specific service session timeout. And you can do this not only for one service, but for multiple services. And then we discussed the TCP end timeout, which by default is set to 20 seconds. And if the firewall sees two fin packets, one in each direction, then it will mark the connection as closed. But it will allow a 20 second grace period before deleting the connection. This is known as the TCP end timeout, which is a grace period that will allow any late trailing packets to pass the firewall during the 20 second end timeout. But once the TCP end timeout period has expired, then any late trailing packets will be dropped as out of state. The TCP end timeout is a global setting that will affect every TCP connection. And then we discussed the UDP virtual session timeout, which keeps track of stateless protocols. The UDP virtual session timeout is by default set to 40 seconds. And as long as that is being exchanged between the two hosts, then this timeout is constantly being refreshed. And once the hosts stop transmitting data, then the virtual session timeout expires and any late trailing packets will be dropped as out of state. And again, with UDP, just like TCP, you can increase the virtual session timeout. There are global settings for all UDP services. And not only for global services, but you might want to be granular and increase or decrease the virtual session timeout per service. And then we also discussed the ICMP virtual session timeout which by default allows a 30 second virtual session timeout window. And since ICMP is a stateless and portless protocol, the firewall will need to keep track of the packet's ID number from the packet's ICMP header. And each ICMP reply packet ID number has to match a request entry in the connection table for the packet to be accepted. But once the 30 second ICMP session timeout window has expired, the connection entry is removed from the connection table and then any late trailing ICMP reply packets that do not match an ICMP request packet, entry will be dropped as out of state. And then finally, we discussed the connection table limit, which has a default limit of 25,000 connections. And if the connection table gets full, then new connections will not be allowed through the firewall. But if you need to, you can increase the connection table limit by doubling the current set limit. And so we discussed that in order to increase the connection table, the system, the hardware must support the amount of connections that you want to increase it to. You need to have the right amount of memory and processing power to process those amount of connections. And so depending on the firewall that was purchased, you can start with a higher connection table set limit. Depending on the network profile, this will determine the connections needed and the connection capacity set limit. And so I hope you found this video informative. I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, shalom and bye for now. Checkpoint. We secure the future.